بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم السلام عليكم Peace be upon you Thank you for joining us on Quran for All Seasons In this episode, we will discuss the first surah of the Quran, the Fatiha a surah which many scholars believe to be the first surah to have been revealed in full sections of other surahs having been revealed before it. A'udhu billahi minash shaytanir rajeem Bismillahir rahmanir rahim Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen Ar rahmanir rahim Malik yawmiddin إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين إهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين الفاتحة means the opening or more literally the opener this title indicates the surah's function as the opener of the book, Fatiha al Kitab, and as the surah with which each of the daily prayers begins. As the Prophet Muhammad wasallam, has said, there is no prayer for one who does not recite the opening of the book. For this reason, the Fatiha is also known as Surah al-Salah, meaning the surah of prayer. The name the opener also speaks to this surah's capacity to open one's heart to faith and belief in God, in God's Messenger, and in God's message. The Fatiha is also known by the title Surat al-Hamd, or the chapter of praise, since it teaches one how to praise God in God's own words. As the Prophet Muhammad said when he was addressing God, there is no way to enumerate the praise that is your due. You are as you have praised yourself. Some say that it is this surah which teaches us how to praise God in God's words, our finite words being, by definition, insufficient. The Fatiha is also called the mother of the book, Um al Kitab, and the mother of the Quran. These titles speak to the manner in which this surah conveys the central lessons of the Quran the essentials of the relationship between the divine and the human. From one perspective, the Fatiha is regarded as the pinnacle of all scripture. As the Prophet Muhammad is reported to have said, not in the Torah, the Gospels, the Psalms, or the Quran has the like of it been revealed. In another account, an angel told the Prophet, Be joyous for two glorious lights which you have been given, that no prophet before you has been given, the opening of the book, and the two verses at the end of Surat al-Baqarah. You do not recite a single letter of them, but that you are given what you ask. The cure, a shifa, is another title of the Fatiha. This title refers to the healing powers these verses have for both body and soul. It is related to verse 57, of Surah 10, that is, Surah Yunus, wherein God says, O mankind, ya ayyuhan nas, there has come unto you an exhortation from your Lord, and a cure for what lies within breasts. This theme is reiterated in verse 82, of Surah 17, Surah Al-Isra, we send down for recitation, or we send down from the Quran, وَنُنَزِّلُ مِنِ الْقُرْآنِ مَا هِيَ شِفَاءٌ وَرَحْمَةٌ لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ That which is a cure and a mercy for the believers. The Prophet Muhammad also referred to the Fatiha as Asab al-Mathani, which means both the seven oft-repeated and the seven praised, indicating that the seven verses of this surah are those that praise God or that the verses themselves are highly praised. 
other titles assigned to the Fatiha are the foundation, al asas since it serves as the foundation of the Qur'an, and the treasure, al kens since it provides a wealth of truth, guidance, and mercy. It is also called the abundance, al wafia and the sufficient, al kafiyah since it provides all that the human being truly needs. Several sayings of the Prophet Muhammad refer to the exalted status of the Fatiha. In one, the Prophet told one of his companions that he would teach him the greatest surah. When asked what it was, the Prophet responded, It is, praise be to God, Lord of the worlds, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, the seven oft repeated, and the mighty Qur'an. In a famous hadith Qudsi, that is, a hadith, which is a non-Qur'anic saying, wherein the Prophet speaks from his intimate understanding of the nature of God. In this saying, the Prophet says that God says, I have divided the prayer between myself and my servant, and my servant shall have that for which he prays. When the servant says, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, praise be to God, Lord of the worlds, God says, my servant has praised me. When the servant says, the merciful, the compassionate, God says, my servant has magnified me. When the servant says, master of the day of judgment, maliki yomiddin, God says, my servant has glorified me. This is my portion, and to him, to the servant, belongs what remains. This Hadith Qudsi provides insight into the Fatiha's exalted status. The first three verses focus upon the nature of God. The middle verse establishes the relationship between the divine and the human. Then the last three verses reflect upon the states of human beings. In this way, the Fatiha is far more than a confessional prayer. It is a declaration that encapsulates all the realities of which a human being must remain mindful, the realities for which one must have taqwa, reverence, mindfulness. From this perspective, God enjoins human beings to recite the Fatiha because it reminds them of God's mercy and sovereignty. It then reveals the attitude human beings must have towards God and the possible human states or conditions in relation to God. The first being that of being on the straight path and being blessed by God, as-sirat al-mustaqim, which is the path of ascent towards God. The second being those who incur wrath, al-maghdubi alayhim. The third is that of being astray, bolin, without the guidance that leads to the path towards God. Many have said that the whole of the Qur'an is encapsulated within the seven oft-repeated verses of the Fatiha. This idea is perhaps best summed up in a famous saying attributed to Ali bin Abi Talib, a cousin of the Prophet Muhammad, who became the fourth Sunni caliph and the first Shiite imam. In this saying, he is quoted as having said, The whole of the Qur'an is in the Fatiha. The whole of the Fatiha is in the Basmala. That is the first verse in the name of God, the merciful, the compassionate. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. And the whole of the Basmala is in the Ba, the B, at the beginning of Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. And the whole of the Ba is in the diacritical point under the Ba. For today's discussion, we will work with the following translation of the Fatiha. In the name of God, the merciful, the compassionate. Praise be to God, Lord of the worlds, the merciful, the compassionate, master of the day of judgment. You we worship, and from you we seek help. Guide us upon the straight path, the path of those whom you have blessed, not of those who incur wrath, nor of those who are astray. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, in the name of God, the merciful, the compassionate, is known as the Basmala. 
Whether or not it is a verse of the Fatiha is debated among scholars. One can read about this in the introduction or the first uh, commentary in the study Quran. Here, I am going to treat it as a verse of the Fatiha. This formula, or its shortened form, in the name of God, Bismillah, is employed by Muslims to consecrate many actions. The Prophet Muhammad wasallam, said, Any important matter not begun with the name of God shall be cut off. The order of the three divine names, Allah, followed by Ar-Rahman, the merciful, then Ar-Rahim, the compassionate, alludes to the levels of divinity in relation to creation. Allah indicates the all-encompassing divine, beyond all else. The merciful, Ar-Rahman, indicates the fullness of God's names and attributes through which we know and relate to God. And the compassionate, Ar-Rahim, refers to God's acts through which we experience God's mercy and guidance in our daily lives. As will be discussed in the podcasts on Surat al-Anqabut and in the podcast on the understanding of God in the Qur'an, Allah was not a new name or concept introduced to Arabia with the advent of the Qur'an. It was used by Jews, Christians, and even pagan Arabs in pre-Islamic Arabia. Rather than introduce an entirely new concept, the Qur'an seeks to realign misunderstandings of Allah that had come to prevail. In this vein, God counsels the Prophet in Surah Al-Qabut, Wert thou to ask them, who created the heavens and the earth, and made the sun and the moon subservient, they would surely say God. La in sa'altahum man khalaqa as-samawati wal ard wa sakhara shamsa wal qamara la yaqulunna Allah. They would surely say God. This indicates that they had some understanding of the nature of God and that this name Allah was the one that they used. Now the manner in which this verse is expressed with no definitive phrase that is, the fact that it does not say, in the name of God, I begin the book, or in the name of God, this, that, or the other thing, all right? Being expressed in this manner makes this a universal declaration that is applicable to all actions. The commentator, al maybudi relates this back to God, as if God is saying, I began by my name, and am united with my name, so begin through my name, unite with my name, and commence in my name. In verse 2, God praises himself, saying, Praise be to God, Lord of the worlds. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. So that human beings can praise God in the speech of God, since they cannot fully praise God with their own words. Praise be to God indicates the highest degree of thanks. The one who is thanked, al-mashkur, is often thanked for specific actions or specific blessings, whereas the one who is praised, al-mahmud, is praised for his very nature, regardless of the actions that spur from that. In the Arabic, al-hamd, praise, literally means the praise, using the definite article here. According to At-Tabari and other commentators, the use of the definite article in this verse indicates that all praise and all gratitude belong to God. The Prophet Muhammad counseled his followers, when you say, praise be to God, Lord of the worlds, you will have thanked God and God will increase your bounty. Similar to the Basmala, praise be to God is a frequently repeated formula that is recited by Muslims on many occasions. While the basmala is employed to consecrate a deed at its beginning, praise be to God is employed to thank God for something upon its completion. In the first two verses of the Quran, we are thus provided the manner in which to start and to complete 
every licit act. God is referred to as Lord of the Worlds, Rabbul Alameen, 42 times in the Quran. This indicates that God is the master who keeps things in order and the nourisher or caretaker of all existence. In this capacity, God says in verse 44 of Surah 17, Surah Al-Isra, there is no thing wa in min shay'in illa yusabbihu bihamdihi. There is no thing save that it hymns or sings his praise. In verse 3, God repeats the formula from the Basmala, the merciful, the compassionate, ar-Rahman, ar-Rahim. These are both intensifications of the word Rahma, meaning loving mercy. Ar-Rahman is considered more emphatic and all-encompassing than ar-Rahim. Ar-Rahim refers to the blessings of nourishment through which God sustains every existent thing. Ar-Rahim can also be used to describe human beings, as when the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam is referred to as Rahim in verse 128 of Surah 9, Surah At-Tawbah, where God says, A messenger has indeed come to you from among yourselves. لَقَدْ جَاءَكُمْ رَسُولٌ مِنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ Heavy upon him weighs what you suffer. عَزِيزٌ عَلَيْهِ مَا عَنِتُّمْ Solicitous is he of you. حَرِيسٌ عَلَيْكُمْ Kind and compassionate unto the believers. بِالْمُؤْمِنِينَ رَأُنْفُ رَحِيمٌ بِالْمُؤْمِنِينَ رَأُنْفٌ رَحِيمٌ this Rahim at the end, referring to the Prophet ﷺ. In contrast to Ar-Rahim, Ar-Rahman refers to a quality possessed only by God, since it indicates the loving mercy by which God brings forth existence. Ar-Rahman is said to be among the most exalted names of God. In this vein, verse 110 of Surah 17 in this verse, God enjoins human beings, or I think he enjoins the prophet here, call upon God, Idullah or Idur Rahman, call upon God or call upon the merciful. Whichever you call upon, to him belong the most beautiful names. Ayyamma tad'u falahu al-asma al-husna. This emphasis on God's mercy being placed between the reference to God's mastery over all space in verse 2 and God's mastery over all time in verse 4 indicates that God's mercy encompasses all space and time. As when God says in verse 156 of Surah 7, Rahmati wasi'at kulla shay, my mercy encompasses every thing. In verse 4, God says, Master of the Day of Judgment. Malik Yomidin. This indicates that God alone rules over the Day of Reckoning. Yom Hisab. And that all those who seek to contend with God's absolute rule will be brought low before God. The Day of Judgment, Yom Din, is the day on which everyone is brought to account for what they have done in this life, that God is master of this day alludes to the inevitability of the meeting with God, since all human beings are returning to him. In describing this day, the Prophet Muhammad said, On the day of judgment, God will grasp the earth, fold up the sky with his right hand, and proclaim, I am the king. Where are the kings of the earth? Where are the tyrants? Following upon the Prophet's advice, the second caliph, Umar ibn al-Khattab, is reported to have said, Hasib, qablan to hasib, bring yourself to account or reckon yourself before you are reckoned, before you are brought to account. 
and weigh your deeds before your deeds are weighed. Such counsel reminds us of the fact that we stand before the master of the day of judgment at every moment of every day. Verse 5 is now, as we said in the introduction, the point where the verse, where the Sura turns to the relationship between God and the human being. Here, human beings say, You we worship, and from you we seek help. The shift from speaking about God in the first four verses to addressing God directly indicates the move to an intimate relationship between the divine and the human. Na'budu, we worship, also means we serve, we obey, and we adore. It indicates standing before God as a humble, adoring servant, or even as an obedient slave, an abd, the word which comes from the same root as abda ya'budu, ein ba'da. In Surat Maryam, God ascribes this state to all created human beings. I'm sorry, not human beings, but to all created beings. There is none in the heavens and the earth, but that it comes to the merciful as a servant. In kullu man fis samawati wal ard, illa ati, illa ati rahmani abdan. There is none in the heavens and the earth, but that it comes to the merciful as a servant, abd. In kullu man fis samawati wal ard, illa ati rahmani abdan. Speaking to God in the first person plural, as saying we, you we worship, rather than the singular, also indicates humility before the divine, because one does not lay claim to a personal ego, a personal I, that stands in opposition to the divine. This verse declaring servitude in humility precedes the request for divine help because one does not seek aid from a king without first acknowledging the king's absolute power and sovereignty. Verse 6. The request for guidance implies seeking to be led to God himself, and thus a desire for intimacy with God and nearness to God. The straight path, as-sirat al-mustaqim, is a clear road with no crookedness. It indicates a way of life that combines the outer guidance of the law or sharia with inner purification of the heart. Tazkiyat al-qalb. God tells us that the Prophet Muhammad guides his community upon this path when he addresses the Prophet in verses 52 and 53 of Surah 42, saying, Truly you guide unto a straight path. The path of God unto whom belongs whatsoever is in the heavens and whatsoever is on the earth. The Prophet's community is thus described as a middle community, ummatun wasatun, that follows a middle way in actions, ethics, thought and all aspects of life. To be on the straight path, or a straight path, as it is usually presented in the Qur'an, can also be understood as walking with God to God. To God, because God guides the believers unto himself upon a straight path. And with God, because God himself is upon a straight path. As when the Prophet Hud says, Truly my Lord is upon a straight path. Inna Rabbi ala siratin mustaqim. From this perspective, this verse provides a prayer to be with God, walking beside God, replacing one's ego with the divine presence through istiqama. The final verse of the opening surah, the path of those whom you have blessed, not of those who incur wrath, nor of those who are astray. 
summarizes the possibilities of the human condition. The straight path of those whom God has blessed is the vertical path of ascent towards God. Those who incur wrath are those who reject God's teachings and are thus upon a path of descent away from God. While those who are astray are without direct guidance, they may meander away from the path that leads towards God. In many ways, the grammatical structure of this final verse of the Fatiha reveals the nature of the relationship between the divine and the human. Those whom you have blessed, an amta alayhim, is an action that has already been performed by God. This means that God's blessings and favor upon them has already occurred. This use of the past tense in Arabic can also indicate a divine promise of something that will certainly happen. Those who incur wrath, al-maghdubi alayhim, is in the passive voice with no active agent. This indicates that although some human beings act in a manner that warrants punishment or retribution, God's wrath has not come upon them. Thus the door of repentance for what wrong they have done remains open. And this is related to what God says in verse 44 of Surah 10, Surah Yunus. Truly God does not wrong human beings at all. Rather, human beings wrong themselves. Being astray, results from something intentional or something that is done by mistake. Thus, those who are astray may not have committed actions that merit punishment or divine retribution. Nonetheless, they do not or do not yet live and act in accord with revelation. Akulu hada wa astaghfirullah. Wa salatu wa salamu ala ashraf al anbiya wa al mursaleen wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Thank you very much for listening to this episode of Quran for All Seasons. Thank you.